Aftermath for the season finale of Colony, Season 1, Episode 10, Gateway, and I was really looking forward to this episode, though I was a bit worried, because as you guys know, I really felt like last week's episode wasn't bad, but it did feel like we were missing something. Like, it felt like there was just something that happened in the previous episode that was supposed to happen and didn't, and that's why last week's episode felt very out of place. But we did get some really good setup for this week's finale, and I gotta say, this was a really great finale. Honestly, probably right up there with episode 8. Episode 8, I still think, is the best episode of the season, but this was still a really great episode, and it also really shows that the direction we're headed, I really think next season's gonna be very different than season 1, which I'm perfectly fine with. I mean... This season was great, don't get me wrong, but I do think it has the potential to be even better in season two. But let's just get into this episode, because the first scene of this episode was very imperative. It's the first glimpse we get of uh, something we've wanted to see ever since the show started. And basically, we see right away the other side of the wall, which was really cool. I mean, we've heard so much about the other side of the wall and that no one wants to go there. And we finally find out why the other side of the wall is so bad. We see that things are definitely less peaceful here There are, you know, than they are in the Los Angeles block. There are people scavenging for food, homeless men walking around, and three street kids are running from red hats. And basically the kids steal a homeless man's stash, which contains food as well as a gun. It's kind of like Oliver Twist a little bit. If you guys know the story of Oliver Twist where they steal things to um, get food and things like that, and basically one of the kids say that they should take this stuff to Solomon, trade for breakfast. Now, who Solomon is, we don't know, but we find out that this son is not just some random guy. This is, in fact, Charlie. Yes, Charlie is living on the other side of the wall. He is with these three other kids who are homeless, and uh, we don't know who Solomon is, and we've only gotten this brief glimpse of Charlie. So already they're setting up for next season, which I can't wait to see where that goes. It very much reminded me of the Mr. Robot finale though where we have this one very important scene the first half of the episode that's never spoke of again throughout the episode but it is setting up for next season and this definitely shows that I'm thinking next season we're gonna see a lot more of this other side of the wall you know this might be the first time we saw it now but I definitely think we're gonna see the other side of it uh, next season and I can't wait to see where that goes because it's a very important scene and I love that we got this glimpse of Charlie because I thought that Charlie was gonna be killed but luckily he's alive and very interesting to see where that's going. So we find out that Katie never came home after the train incident. Will gets awakened by a pounding at the door, and it's Jennifer delivering the news that a VP has been abducted by the, res the Resistance, and at least Bo has the courtesy to bring coffee. And speaking of Bo, Jennifer tells Will that she went by Bo's place and he was gone. Where he is, we don't know, but he just disappeared. And... That's something that is already something to do because Bo's not in this episode at all. We have no idea where Bo is, and we're probably not going to see him again because I'm just assuming that Bo's, you know, um, not going to be in the show anymore, which is interesting. So Jennifer knows that you haven't included her in a lot of their plans, and she would prefer to be in the loop since when they screw up, she's stuck dealing with the blowback. You know, she's the one that has to give them all information, things like that. But, you know, for the most part, um, sorry guys, I'm just switching angles here. For the most part, when uh, Jennifer, you know, has been involved with things, she's basically just given the information. They've been the ones that actually get to do all the a action, things like that. And she wants to be more into missions. And I think it's very interesting for Jennifer to see. And basically, ba basically, Will says the reason he and Bo kept her in the dark was so she wouldn't have to deal with the blowback. Because he doesn't want her to have to deal with that kind of stuff. You know, it's really hard to deal with. And you can tell that it really has changed both of them. And that's kind of the reason I think that Bo left, because he just couldn't handle it anymore. So... Very interesting, but I gotta say, this episode, I still don't fully know if we can trust Jennifer. I mean, just if you remember that questionable thing she said in that one episode, I'm still not entirely sure if we can trust her. So, Jennifer, I still don't know. Very interesting. But then we see that Helena's at Homeland. Snyder is no longer running Homeland, and it's all hands on deck now. The VIP guest, Hyper Rion, has been abducted, and not sure at this point if he's dead. Broussard and Katie may have taken the body, but it is confirmed that Hyper Rion was one of the hosts, and Will questions where Snyder is, but Helena announces that she'll be in charge of the recovery operation, that Snyder's no longer in charge, and she warns everyone just how much is at stake, and it makes sense why Snyder's no longer in charge. I mean, maybe maybe it was just too much for him to handle, or maybe he was doing something wrong, but we knew that Helena threatened him before, and that Helena was his boss. So it makes sense why Helena's now the boss, and 
she really is very, you know, powerful as this boss. I mean, not that Snyder wasn't, but Snyder was very emotional. He really thought things through, and Helena it seems like she doesn't really think things through. She has plans executed already, and she just goes with it. So during the arrival, two of the hosts were killed in Dallas. Now that the city is a flash sea sheet of glass, there's a brief window of opportunity before the raps take action, and Helena warns that the host, um, that wants the host back and whoever took it, because there's definitely a host gone, and we've heard so much about the hosts, and we kind Kind of did get to see a brief glimpse of them last week. We don't see them in this episode, though. We hear about them, but we don't see them. And I know people are upset about that, but it's something like, um, you know, it's something that I don't think we necessarily need to see. We don't really need to see what the hosts look like yet. There's still time in the show to develop that. And the show's never truly been about the hosts. Yes, the hosts are the reason they're living in this, you know, environment that they are living in. Um, and the conditions are the way they are, but the show is really about humans and how they deal with this sort of thing, and I think that's one of the things that works so well with the show. Very much like with The Walking Dead, we don't need to see walkers every episode, we just need to know the fears out there, and I think that's what works so well with the show, is that we know that the hosts are always out there watching their every move, pretty much. So Katie Broussard, Eckhart, Beebe, and Morgan are debating what to do with the host's body because obviously they just saw this body. They don't really know what they're going to do here, and Broussard wants to just dump it. That's the best thing to do. Just keep it away. Don't let anyone know it's there. But obviously they know it's out there. Like Helena just said, look, we know there's a host out there, so they really don't know what to do here because the purpose of the mission was to get alive humans they could interrogate, not a dead rap, and Eckhart points out that there's a huge amount of value to the host and the chance to learn some about the alien species. He, Beebe, and Morgan believe there reward is worth the risk and I still don't really care as much about Eckhart, BB, and Morgan that's the thing but they're a part of this team now so I'm sure we're going to see more of them next season and uh, I'm fine with that definitely I think I, we're definitely going to see more of them but still down the tunnels the group decides to make their way back to the loft that serves as their safe house and by the way, we never really see any scenes between Katie and Will in this episode, really to show how divided these two are. Katie's not going to get back on Will's side, which I still don't necessarily understand why Katie would just decide to abandon Will and, like, betray him like that. That part didn't really work, but it worked for me in this episode. It just, it made a little bit more sense, I think. BB points out the Raps may have a locator. Katie thinks that if they did, if it did, they would already be surrounded by Red Hats, but Eckhart reminds her that they're underground. BB takes out a device to scan the body, discovers that there's a tracking device, and they devise a plan to block the signal. That's what they want to do. So Will returns home, tells Maddie all hell is about to break loose and that they need to get the kids somewhere safe. She can get them into the green zone, and Maddie explains that she's been working for the number two in the political wing, and he'll help her. So it seems like Maddie now is going to be the one to help Will, since Katie is of no longer of service to them, because now she's working on the opposing side Maddie's going to be the one to help, which I think is a good direction to take her character. It makes her storyline more interesting. And as you guys know, I personally haven't been as into her storyline. So do, giving her this to do definitely makes her a lot more interesting and gives and makes me more interested in her character. So Will asks Bram if he knows where Katie is, and Bram swears that he doesn't, but Will can tell his son is hiding something because, you know, he knows that there's something that Bram is hiding. And Bram is saying he knows Katie's been working with the Resistance, but he doesn't know the details, including her current location. Now, that's true. Bram's not lying. We know that Katie hasn't told her children anything. My only complaint with this episode is that we really don't get anything about Gracie. We know that Gracie was brainwashed by Lindsay. We know that happened. And... We don't really hear a ton about it in this episode, which I was a bit upset about. I was hoping we'd see maybe a little bit more of Gracie being brainwashed by Lindsay or something that was going on there, but not really in this episode. We hear of Lindsay, but we don't really get to see that, and that's something that I'm sure they're saving for next season. I understand that, but I really did want to see that because that was definitely one of the more interesting aspects of last week's episode, and we didn't really hear about it here. So, Will explains that Katie is in way over her head, she's in real danger, and he knows that she has made a terrible decision. Like, her staying with the Resistance is a terrible thing, and she's going to get hurt very seriously. And what I love about this is, even though she's turned against Will, and even though they're on opposite sides, he still wants to save his wife because he loves her and will make sure nothing bad happens to her. Which really shows how much Will really cares about her and how much of a good guy Will really is. I mean, a lot of people have wondered, is Will really the good guy? Yeah, this shows he is a good guy, and I think they showed that really well here. So, basically, Will can help her if he can get her right to her right away, and Bram hands over the phone number his mother gave him the night before, and Bram wants to come along and help, but Will warned wants him in the green zone with the rest of the family, because that's where they're headed. They're headed to the green zone, because they're going to be safer there, and 
Wilden calls the number, which is a lar landline loft, and Katie and company haven't made it back yet. They're roaming the streets with wrapped up body of a possibly dead host, and they're avenging... Um, they're, they're averaging five blocks per hour, and more red hats are appearing by the minute, and an alarm begins to ring, and Broussard realizes that they're putting the city on lockdown just out of nowhere. There's curfew in the middle of the day, and obviously Katie's like, what's going on here? Why is this happening? But it makes sense, obviously, that Will is the one that basically set this up. He did this so that way they could get to Katie, and that way she should be safe. So Morgan sits out in the street in front of an oncoming car full of red hats. When they emerge to arrest her for raking curfew, Broussard guns them down, and Morgan looks a bit shell-shocked because, you know, she didn't know that's what this job requires, but they don't have time to waste because, you know, they have to get on with the mission, and that's the thing. They, they, they can't just, you know, they can't really think about it. And that's the thing with Katie. Katie comforts Morgan here, reminding her that they're, what they're doing is important, and Morgan has to remember that. And it really shows how far Katie's come. I mean, we remember in episode three, she was terrified of, of you know, um, of Broussard just killing people and gunning them down and things like that. Now Katie understands this is their life. This is what their job entails. And if that's what they have to do, that's what they have to do. And I think it's very interesting the direction they've taken Katie in. I mean, it really seemed like she wasn't enjoying what she was doing, but here it really seems like she understands this is the world now and she can't really do anything about it. So, basically, very interesting the way that that's going, and she doesn't even seem to care that they're getting killed, because she understands that's what this job requires, and I really like seeing that. So, when Maddie arrives at the entrance to the green zone, the scene is completely chaotic. I mean, this scene really is crazy. She told us she didn't on the list, but Maddie reminds that they call and speak to Nolan, and while she's distracted, Bram slips away, and you know where Bram is going. You know he's going to go to his teacher, and they're going to find out what's going on there. Nolan gives gets Maddie in, but she has time to search for Bram. If she doesn't go in, she loses her chance. So, basically, she's forced to do this, and... Snyder then shows up at some kind of communal living space, and I think this is the first, well, not the first time, but this was the first time in a while we've seen Snyder do something that has nothing to do with uh, the occupation. You, of course, he's working there, but he's no longer working there. He's now been denounced there, and we really get to see where Snyder's headed next season, which I can't wait to see where that goes. So the residents look like your run-of-the-mill hippie wannabes. That's basically what they are. They have, like, really long hair. They look like they belong in the 60s, and... They recognize him, but nobody speaks to or approaches him. He asks for Cynthia and finds the girl a bedroom. Now we very, we very, we had very little details about this last week, and I didn't, I don't remember hearing about this in a while. I'm sure this was, I think this was the beginning of the season. But if you guys remember, Snyder mentioned that he had a daughter that was taken away, and we find out that Cynthia is Snyder's daughter, and he is embarrassed that she's embarrassed that he's there. She clearly hasn't seen him in a while, and. This very much makes me think this is what's going to happen if Will ever encounters Charlie. Charlie is going to feel very awkward. He's not going to know what to do. And it's clear that she's made a life of her own here. And she is embarrassed that he's there. He tells her that he's out of proxy. And he tells her things are going to get very bad in the, in the block and offers her a transit pass. And that he needs her. And Cynthia questions if things are so bad. Why doesn't her father use the pass? But there's no way that Snyder can go where they won't find him. Because obviously they're going after him. They want to denounce him um, in the position he is. And he doesn't really know what's going to happen. So he pleads with Cynthia to take it, but she says that after the way Snyder treated her mom, she swore that she was done with him, and that includes him on the up, up accepting the pass. He apologized, but her only response is okay, and it seems like he has convinced her, but you don't really know if he's convinced her, which is very interesting. I'm interested in seeing really what Snyder did to his wife that could make Cynthia so upset, because clearly something happened with Snyder and his wife. Now, we haven't met Snyder's wife. We didn't even know he really had a wife. Obviously, we knew that there was someone in his life because he had a daughter, but we haven't heard about his wife till now. So our, I'm sure we're going to meet her next year. I'm interested in seeing what's really going to happen with her next season, and that, again, really shows where Snyder's headed, and I like seeing that. So Maddie tells Nolan her nephew walked away before she could get him through the gate. Nolan says the best thing they can hope is for Homeland is that Homeland picks them up. And Maddie wants to know what's going on. Nolan tells her about the abduction. Snyder's out and with the Governor General is going to select a new proxy to run the block and know his future's up in the air depending on who takes over. He's got to pick a side. Now remember, we don't we haven't met the Governor General yet. We still have yet to meet him and I thought we were going to meet him this episode, but we still haven't met him and 
He's worried that he'll choose the wrong one. Matty advised him to support everyone until he absolutely has to decide. And uh, they don't want to choose someone that they know is not going to be good enough to run. They want to choose someone who can run. They want to choose a good proxy. And uh, they want to choose the right person. They don't just want to bullshit. And I can totally understand that. I mean, choosing a proxy is like choosing a president of the United States. This is the person that's going to run the entire block. And someone, you know, has to do that that's resourceful. Someone that cares what they're doing. And you can't just bullshit it. And I like that she said that, definitely. So Bram goes to see Mr. Carson, but the teacher doesn't want to venture out during curfew because obviously that's very dangerous. But Bram says that he made it all the way from the green zone without any issue, and all the red hats are otherwise occupied, so they take off for the tunnel. Despite the fact that Carson didn't want to, Bram wants to, so they're going to do it. Now, obviously, we knew this wasn't going to go well, but they at least they tried. You know, that's the thing. At least they tried. We knew this wasn't going to go well for them, but I like that Bram at least wanted to try and venture out. You knew that was going to happen at some point. Paya doesn't get involved. I thought Paya was going to get involved here, but we don't even hear about Paya in this episode. So I don't know if we're going to hear about her next season or if that was just a random thing, but that really didn't go anywhere. If I had to say anything about Bram's plot is that Paya's plot didn't really go anywhere. Like We heard about the rabbit hole and everything, but we don't really know, you know, is Paya going to get involved? Is she going to help him? Because we don't even hear about her in this episode, and I was thinking that Bram was going to take Paya with him, but he didn't. Superstar and Katie are still trying to make it off the streets. They encounter a ton of drones and witness as they blow a building to bits. And as Bruce Starr drives off, Morgan questions if this is all their fault and that they're the ones responsible. Because really, if you think about the Resistance, while we're supposed to be rooting for them, they do such terrible things that they're really starting to wonder, are we really the good guys here? So Snyder and Helena witness the same explosion from a much safer distance. Snyder doesn't understand the point of punishing innocent people, but Helena says it's retribution as well as a way to remind everyone who is the bug and who is the kid with the magnifying glass. You know, even if these people are innocent, they need to understand, you know, who really is in charge here, and that's really what they need to do. So Snyder wants to know who's replacing him, but Helena claims not to know, which... You kind of think that she does, like maybe she's hiding this room or she doesn't want him to know, but clearly Snyder isn't really as close to her and he seems to not mean as much to her, definitely, now that he's been denounced. And when he questions what's going to happen to him, all Helena will say is that she always likes him and she's sorry things didn't work out. So she doesn't really give him an answer if he's going to be, you know, if, if who's his next replacement's going to be, which is very interesting. And it's kind of, to me, seemed like, look, I like what you did, you did a very good job, but this is it, you're no no longer going to be working for me and it's really sad you really do see that look in Snyder's face like oh shit this is really it for me so Katie and Broussard and company finally make it back to the lot but their troubles are just beginning Katie's not okay with what's going on as they as, as long as they hold onto the host more people are going to die Eckhart says the raps have killed countless humans and at least they're doing it for a purpose the phone rings and Katie answers Eckhart isn't happy to find out Katie gave out the number but she insists that she gave it to her son strictly in case of an emergency and uh you know, basically that's what it's for. So Will's on the other end of the line. He wants to know where Katie is because obviously he wants to keep her safe. Even though, like I said, she's on the other side, he still wants to keep her safe because he does love her. And you kind of wonder, does she still feel the same way about Will? He tells her that the whole block is being blown up because of what she's done. And Katie pretends that she's speaking to Bram because she obviously, Will is dead to them, really. She can't really talk about Will. So she says he needs to get to the green zone and Will responds, the kids are there already. And that's all she needs to know. So she hangs up on him. So obviously it's a very tense scene and you really do see I think Will's realizing that she's kind of gone like he can't really help her anymore and even though he wants to he can't really do anything so Will brings the phone number to Jennifer, asks her to track it. She wanted to be on the inside, and now she is. And I'm really wondering, is this safe for Jennifer to do? Because, again, I don't really know if I 100% trust Jennifer. There's just something about her that I really haven't trusted. Her whole thing, yes, we know that she had this, you know, supposed husband that died um, in the war and everything. And it was very hard for her to, to deal with, but I still don't know if I fully believe it. Just something about it, it doesn't sound legit. It sounds like there's something more that she's hiding. What that is, I don't know. But to me personally, I don't necessarily believe her right now. So, Will and Jennifer used the book to decipher a code they got off, Rachel, after she was killed in the market, and the message must have been what we'll called her to the meeting, and it mentioned a special opportunity with a new engineer, specifically one who could block a tracking signal, and they go through the surveillance video from the day at the market where Broussard set up a meeting between Quayle and Eckhart, and Will spots the moment when Broussard warned Eckhart that the meeting was off, and... 
basically. Jennifer runs Eckhart's phase through the Rolodex. They learn Eckhart's identity and that before the arrival, he was the founder and CEO of a startup that was making micro drones. And they're able to get the address of the loft. Will asks Jennifer to give him a 20 minute head start. Jennifer knew Phyllis suspected Katie of working the resistance and Will confirms it with actually without actually saying as much. And I like that he didn't say straight out, but he, you know, Jennifer can kind of tell that Katie is definitely working with them. And Jennifer, um, you know, basically uh, Jennifer to let him have a shot at getting his wife, but before she sends in the cavalry, Snyder then has a plan. He wants Nolan's boss to become the new proxy and has figured out a way to get the guy's name on the shortlist. He feels that this guy is the right one to do it, but you really have to think, does Snyder really get a say in who's the proxy? Because I don't really think he does. He should, but that isn't really what it seems like. It seems like Helena gets the final say. And Helena needs to convince the host that the block can be salvaged. Snyder's a copy of the emergency protocol the transitional authority used in Seattle to quell an uprising with minimal population loss. Nolan needs to get to his boss to take the plane to Helena and convinces her that he's the man to implement it and all Snyder wants in return is a level free job in the authority. He just wants to continue working there. He doesn't need to be the big proxy or whatever. He just wants a job and Nolan doesn't make any promises telling Snyder he'll do what he can but he might not necessarily be able to work there anymore which is really sad. Honestly, I really felt for Snyder in this episode. Not that I haven't before but I really feel like this was the episode that showed that Snyder's just as vulnerable as all of them and he is not as powerful as we think he is now that he's no longer proxy he doesn't get to make as many decisions and he doesn't really get to do as many things as he could before so very interesting the way that's going so bb morgan and eckhart try to remove the rap suit but aren't having any luck katie wants to cut their losses morgan figures out they've been going about it the wrong way they've been using brute force but the suit is tech a bit mechanical so they managed to get a hold of the device used for communication they're geeky scientists so this is a big deal to them because obviously this is what they do and katie and broussard aren't as impressed you know because this isn't really what they should be doing and Will then begins banging on the door. He doesn't want to argue. He just wants the host. Will asks if it's still alive. Katie says he doesn't. She doesn't think so. He warns her homeland is coming for all of them. And he asks Katie to give him the rap. He said he can say they disappeared before he got there. Will tells his wife she made her point, but she can't win. And Katie says she'll talk to the others. Will could give a damn about them, but Katie isn't gonna bail on them just yet. He doesn't really care about the others. He just cares that his wife is safe, and he doesn't feel this is the right way for her to stay safe. She doesn't seem to care about him as much, though. So she seems to care really about what she's doing and she wants to really do something good and she admits to Eckhart that Will works the occupation he thinks he's been set up but Broussard assures him that that isn't the case he says Will's an ally who's been feeding them intel on the occupation and Katie said and finally they find out who Will is and you really see that this is kind of a relief for them because they've heard about Will but they didn't really know who he was and Katie says that Will came to warn them that Homeland's coming with everything they have and once they arrive Will won't be able to hold them back and the geek squad wants more time Broussard gives them five minutes telling Katie it may Maybe their only chance to examine a rap and that Will might have a point here and the loft and I like that Katie doesn't necessarily trust Will like she doesn't really think he's doing the right thing and she kind of is asking Broussard for the final say which is very interesting. So the loft is set up with a containment area built so the raps tracker can't be traced. Katie breaches the containment, so now they have no choice but to run. Everybody but Katie escapes through a trap door in the floor. And outside, Will sees that drones have started to arrive. He runs back to inside to find Katie still in the loft. He also gets to see the raps, and Katie makes it out. Will's left to deal with the mess. Snyder thinks Will. Apparently, a dead VIP is better than no VIP. So Snyder gives him a pass to get through the Santa Monica gateway. He suggests Will hurry if he wants to find his son. And it appears that Will's going to be doing this on his own like now Katie doesn't want to help him he's just going to find his son on his own and really everything else has worked out but what I liked about this is that Will's not just concerned about finding his son he's also concerned that his family's safe and Katie, he sees it's not going to work. Katie's not going to budge. She's not going to get out of the resistance, whatever. That's where she is. His kids are safe, though. They are in the green zone. They should be fine. Maddie's there, too. As long, But Bram, he doesn't know that Bram's gone away. He doesn't know about that. So Snyder tells Will he's an honorable man and not to let them take that away from him. And it's a good scene. It really shows that Snyder thinks, look, you're doing the right thing. No one should have to take that away from you. Don't let anyone tell you different. You are doing the right thing here. So Nolan must have executed Alana's plan because he tells Maddie that he's the chief of staff for the new governor proxy, and he also has another surprise for her. Lindsay, Maddie doesn't know that Lindsay is just a tutor, is not just a tutor babysitter. So 
obviously this is going to end up really badly because we know that Lindsay's the one brainwashing Gracie, and, I'm, and since she's brainwashing Gracie, I do think she's going to end up brainwashing Maddie, possibly, because if she can do that, then definitely there's more going on with her. We still don't fully know what's going on with Lindsay, but definitely something's going on there. We'll have to see what's going on. That's going to be very interesting. So then we get to the end of this episode. We see Bram and Carson make it to the DWB, DWP building. Red Hearts are waiting, and they're both arrested, so that didn't work out for them. They're not going to be able to find what they want to find because now they're arrested, and I'm pretty sure they're going to be taken to the factory. I could really see that happening, and that'd be terrible, but I do feel like that's where they're headed. Snyder's escorted out of his office by a team of Red Hats. It's a very devastating scene. You really see that Snyder what is no longer able to work there, and now he's kind of have to start out and find really what he wants to do because this is no longer his office, and Helena never promised him you can still work here, so I don't really know where Snyder's head next to It's going to be interesting to see where that goes, but then we see the end of the episode. Will heads into Santa Monica to search for Charlie. Katie arrives home to an empty house. She slides down on the kitchen floor, and she doesn't realize it, but she's being watched, and that's where the episode ends. So, how, who's watching Katie? That's what I want to know. Who's watching Katie? What's going on with that? Clearly, there's someone who's keeping very close watch of her. I don't know who's keeping watch of her, but someone is definitely watching Katie, and I'm interested in seeing what's really going on there. Will, looking for Charlie, this could end up really badly, because he has to be careful about what he does. He shouldn't be on the other side, and he doesn't know what Charlie's been doing. Charlie seems to be a rebel and a criminal on the other side of the wall, on the other side of the wall. So we'll have to see what's going on there. Who is Solomon? That's definitely some interest in him with Charlie. Who's Solomon? Who, you know, what does Solomon run? You know, what kind of, you know, what position does he have in this world? Because we don't know too much about the other side of the wall. We just know that it's a very crime-infested world and things are crazy there. And I don't think Will realizes really what he's getting himself into. Because if Will thinks he can survive, I mean, I don't really think he knows, especially since he's a good man, he doesn't do things like that. This could really end up very badly for him, but I really do see Will maybe going in a different direction next season. We'll have to see what happens there. Snyder, honestly, I think is in the worst position right now because Snyder's now been denounced as the proxy and has to start over, and is Cynthia going to agree to come back? I mean, obviously, something happened between Snyder and his wife. We don't know what that is, but that's something I'm definitely looking forward to um, seeing what's going on there, and I can't wait to see what's going on with... Um, Snyder and his wife. If we find, I, I'm pretty sure we're going to meet his wife next season because they wouldn't just randomly say that. There has to be a reason why we taught why, why we found that out in this episode because it seemed like a small thing. But again, the whole thing with him having a daughter seemed like a small thing, and now it's not a small thing. And I can't wait to see what happens with that. Definitely interested in finding out um, what happened between Brand uh, Snyder and his wife. That's honestly one of the things I'm most looking forward to is finding out what's going on there. Bram and Carson, I'm pretty sure they're going to be taking the factory. I don't see things going well for them. I mean, they had a reason, obviously, to go into space, things like that. Are they going to be able to succeed with their mission? We'll have to see what's going on. It's going to be very interesting. And especially since Carson didn't want to do this, this could end up really bad for them. We'll have to see what happens with that, though. Uh, Maddie, of course, doesn't know what's going on with Lindsay. We don't really know what's going on with Lindsay, though. We know that Lindsay is brainwashing Gracie, but other than that, we don't know how she's doing it, what's going on with her. We know there's a book and everything that she gave Gracie, but what is Lindsay really? Is she, a, is she like, half host? Is she working with them? I mean, we don't really know. So we'll have to see what's going on with Lindsay. Obviously, Maddie doesn't know what she's getting herself into, and we'll have to see what's going on there. Very interesting overall. I like this development with Katie, though, because Katie, you can tell, really has proved that she wants to stay loyal to the Resistance because she cares about their lives, and she wants to run things, and it really is a huge development for her. We'll have to see where that's going to go. I really do believe it. I know last week, I'm like, I don't know if this really makes a lot of sense, but here, I really do think it does. We'll have to see what's going on there. Very interesting what's going on with her as well. Jennifer. Can we trust Jennifer? I mean, there's a part of me that feels like we can, but get, again, that story she told, I kind of feels kind of bullshitty, and... It seems like the direction is that Jennifer's going to work with Will and she's going to be like the new Bo because Bo is now gone. But can we really trust Jennifer? Because I, I don't really know what's going to happen there. I mean, I always felt like there was something going on with her. So I'm still very not certain on if we can trust Jennifer or not. We'll have to see what's going on there. Me personally, I don't know if we can trust her. What do you guys think? We'll have to see. Let's talk about this season overall because overall, I really did enjoy this first season. I do think next season's going to be very different, much more intense. The stakes are going to be much higher and that it's 
it's going to be a lot more crazier. Definitely, I could see us going in that direction. But I do think this was a very strong first season. It was never a sci-fi show. I always saw this as more of a fam, you know, a family drama. A lot of this was a family drama. Now we have this broken family, and they're going to be divided. And I hope that works because a lot of shows I've seen a million times. First season they're together, second season they're all divided, and things have really changed for this family. You can tell. I mean, look back to the first episode when things were the way they were, and now they're this way. We'll have to see what's going on there. But overall, guys, I'm much guys saw this season finale. Love to hear your thoughts. And I'm honestly really looking forward to next season. I think next season's going to be awesome. And the cliffhangers we left on this season I thought was great. I definitely really love this finale. Great finale overall. Let me know what you guys saw this finale. We'll see you guys in my next video, which will be for Daredevil, and I will see you guys for that. Okay, bye.